The Panavia Tornado is one of the most impressive and effective aircraft of the mid-70s. It comes in bomber, fighter, maritime, attack and reconnaissance versions. It is true to say, the Tornado has become the backbone of NATO's European Air Forces. And it was set to continue that well into the 1980s. The thinking behind the Panavia Tornado dates back to the early 1960s. Since the late 50s, the British Royal Air Force had provided the bulk of NATO's European deterrent bomber force in the shape of three V bomber types. But these aircraft had been built as high-altitude bombers. In 1960, after the shooting down of Gary Power's U-2 spy plane, new tactics had to be developed. The V bombers found themselves operating under all rigors of low-level flight. One by one, they began to suffer from structural fatigue brought on by the stress of low flying. It soon became obvious that the purpose-built, low-level bombers were what was required. Two major Europe-wide discussions now had a profound effect on future military strategy. First, it was obvious that the European nations alone could never sustain a major war against the Soviet bloc. So, most of Western Europe resorted to collective security, relying heavily on the American military presence. Second, most European countries decided not to increase their defense budgets. Britain, however, chose to go it alone. It designed and produced an advanced, low-level nuclear strike aircraft which could respond to a Soviet advance across Central Europe. This aircraft, the TSR-2, would perhaps have been the most advanced bomber in the world at that time had it not been for a combination of aircraft industry bickering in costs. TSR-2 was a bold design created by the best brains in Britain Aviation. Vickers Aviation, English Electric and the Bristol Aeroplane Company had merged to form the British Aircraft Corporation, and this collective newcomer to the scene set about producing a large shoulder wing tactical strike reconnaissance aircraft, hence TSR, that could fly at high supersonic speeds and even reach Mach 1 at ultra-low level. In 1963, 13 TSR-2s were ordered. The unbelievably high cost for the time of £690 million, it was much more than any British defense program had cost before. To make matters worse, Virtually all of the rest of British aircraft industry had merged to form a second major conglomerate called Hawker Siddeley. In 1965, in a giddy atmosphere of intercompany squabbling and rocketing costs, the new British Labour government cancelled the whole project. To fill the gap, the American General Dynamics F-111 swing-wing bomber was ordered, and then that was cancelled as well. Finally, the RAF was given two aircraft as stopgap replacements, the American McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom Fighter Bomber and the British Blackburn Buccaneer that had been purpose-built for the Royal Navy as a low-level strike bomber. The cancellation of TSR-2 had a major effect on the British aircraft industry it demonstrated clearly that Britain could not compete alone against the American aviation industry giants. In fact, it became obvious that no European nation could produce a major aviation project by itself. 
This realization spurred the European aircraft industry into cooperation and joint work. The development of an Anglo-French supersonic airliner was already underway. It was one of the few projects that had survived those widespread cuts of the previous decade. It was also joined by an Anglo-French fighter-bomber design they called Jaguar. The strength of the Jaguar concept was to prove itself many years later in the close support of ground forces involved in the Gulf War. So this was the background to the development of the multi-role combat aircraft, the MRCA, that would become the Tornado. The early thinking that eventually led to the MRCA was actually about a replacement for the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. Britain was not involved at this stage because the Royal Air Force had never been equipped with F-104s. But these thought processes took another unexpected turn when the emphasis moved towards a requirement for bombing and reconnaissance. Now, Britain began to take an interest. From the outset, the cost was supremely important. Two important design considerations meant that the aircraft would only need to be about half the weight and size of the TSR-2, so it would be substantially cheaper. The two differences were that the wings would have variable seatback and the weapons would be carried externally. By the time the final requirements for the aircraft were drawn up, many of the original prospective partners had pulled out. The result was a tri-national concern called Panivia Aircraft. It was run by Britain, Germany and Italy. The main contractors were the British Aircraft Corporation, BAC, Messerschmitt, Belkov, Bloom of Germany, NBB, and Air Italia. On the 14th of August 1974, the first of nine MRCA prototypes flew in Germany. The first aircraft was then used to assess general handling and performance, and later prototypes went on to test all of the facets of an advanced modern strike aircraft. By the time Tornado GR-1s entered service with the RAF in 1982, the aircraft had developed into the most advanced interdictor strike aircraft in production in Europe. It was truly multi-role. Tornado was expected to cover virtually anything that it was asked of it, with the sole exception of dedicated air combat. It was expected to take on counter-air operations against airfield, interdiction over the battlefield, close air support, reconnaissance, and even maritime attack, and to do all of those things in all weathers. To fulfill all of those roles, Tornado had to remain undetected. By flying at high speeds and low level, it protects itself with a selection of self-defense aids and is capable of delivering a wide range of weapons. The speed comes from two Rolls-Royce RB199 turbofans. They give Tornado a maximum speed of Mach 2.2 and level flight above 36,000 feet. But they can also deliver supersonic speed at ultra-low level. To get under enemy radar, Tornado has an automatic terrain-following radar. Low-level attack avionics allow it to press home attacks at night in conditions that would ground many other combat aircraft.
its defense capabilities, Tornado carries electronic countermeasure systems either in pods under the wings or internally. And perhaps, most importantly for a multi-role aircraft, Tornado's variable geometry wings provide a high degree of strike effectiveness for low-level flight. At high speeds, the wings are swept fully back. Mid-sweep works best when agility and maneuverability are required. Forward sweep is used for short takeoffs and landings, and with the wings fully forward and using the reverse thrust of the engines, needs less than 3,000 feet of landing run. That means that it can land on short runways or even on stretches of road. It's also able to use parts of damaged airfields and dispersed bases. After a sortie, a tornado can be turned around in about 40 minutes. Even when targets are changed, they can actually change a complete engine within that time as well. Tornado has two cockpits, the pilot flying the aircraft and monitoring the system sits at the front. The navigator is also the weapon systems operator, and he or she sits at the back. The navigator loads the mission data into the computer systems, and then, by operating the screens on either side of the radar, he or she has control over the mission room plan. During a mission, the navigator also controls all the air-to-ground weapons. Laser and radar raging provide the accuracy that's needed for delivering weapons. That was amply demonstrated in 1984, when the crews from the 617th Squadron won the prestigious bombing and navigation competition that's run by the U.S. Air Force. That kind of accuracy means that on operations, most attacks are successful in a single pass. The force had been bolstered by the arrival of the Phantom, but that too had its problems, mostly because the government had insisted that it should be re-engined with the Rolls-Royce Spey. It didn't prove as successful as they'd hoped. Many American fighters were considered and tested, but none were suitable for the specific needs of NATO strategy. The requirement was for an aircraft that could carry medium-range air-to-air missiles. It should have a look-down, shoot-down radar system, and it should be capable of long-range combat air patrol. Tornado seemed to fit the bill, especially as it could be refueled in flight. So, when the production of the GR-1s were ordered, three prototypes for an air defense variant, PADV, were commissioned at the same time. The basic design of the aircraft was the same, but there were different avionics and weapons. The Tornado F-3 is a part of a secure information system that provides data from a wide area supplied by airborne early warning aircraft. Like the GR-1, the F-3 is armed with a 27mm Aiden gun, but it also carries two types of air-to-air -air missiles for medium-range attacks. There are four Skyflash missiles with classic AI M9L Sidewinders for short-range use. Although the aircraft were built by the same tri-national consortium as the bombers, only the RAF and subsequently the Royal Saudi Air Force ordered them. The next version of the Tornado is the GR-1A, the reconnaissance variant, otherwise known as the ECR for electronic combat and reconnaissance. The GR-1A uses an emitter location system to detect and identify enemy radar. The ECR tornadoes carry AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missiles and later the more advanced bomb-range anti-radiation missiles. Arm and Alarm for short, both of them are dedicated to destroying enemy radars. Tornado was originally developed to counter the threat from the Soviet Union. The battlefield would have the great central plains of Europe, where it was expected that Soviet tanks would roll across the frontier into West Germany. They have been supported by Soviet aircraft that would have been amongst the tornado's targets. But in 1989, everything changed. The breakup of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism led to profound changes in NATO defense policy. Almost overnight, 
the main enemy was seeking peace, and the whole basis for the West's thinking had become redundant. The British government sought to take advantage of the so-called peace dividend by drastically reducing its defense expenditure. Reductions were proposed that would cut the size of the RAF to its lowest level for 50 years. The plan, called Options for Change, was presented to Parliament on the 25th of July, 1991. Weeks later, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Saddam Hussein's Iraqi forces seemed poised to take over the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and thus strangle with the West's oil supplies. As the United Nations pressed resolutions condemning the act of aggression, British and American air bases prepared to rush reinforcements to Saudi Arabia and deter further Iraqi incursions. The priority was to send fighters in airborne early warning aircraft. On the 11th of August 1990, RAF Tornado F-3 fighters landed at Dakran in Saudi Arabia. They immediately began flying combat air patrols along the Kuwaiti border. At that point, the coalition forces were vastly outnumbered by the Iraqi Air Force that was equipped with highly capable Soviet-built MiG-29s, MiG-25s, and French Mirage F-1s. Over a period of four and a half months, coalition forces in the Gulf were built up on a massive scale. The American codename for this reinforcement was Operation Desert Shield. The RAF's contribution was called Operation Granby. The tornado was the backbone of the RAF in the Gulf. The 18 F-3 fighters were soon joined by a formidable force of 62 GR-1 bombers. The Middle East was a vastly different operating environment from the Northern European theater, where so many RAF aircrew had trained to fight. However, their training had emphasized flexibility, and they were ready for the casks ahead. One thing that was still important for the Tornado crew was low-level training, but now, in a complete change from their former German environment, their speed and nose were unrestricted. They flew at high subsonic speeds, hugging the sand dunes to stay below the lethal enemy radar coverage. These tornado infrared camera shots show how extreme the conditions could be. In December 1990, the United States nation passed a resolution to liberate Kuwait. When Iraq failed to comply with the UN's demands, Operation Desert Shield became Desert Storm. At 1.30 on the morning of 17th of January 1991, Tomahawk cruise missiles were fired from U.S. warships in the Persian Gulf. They were followed by wave after wave of coalition bombers hitting radar stations and communications. Any Iraqi aircraft that had resisted was shot down if it wasn't already fleeing from the battle. The RAF tornadoes had a special task in this vast scenario. They were to fly in at an ultra-low level and destroy Iraq's airfields with the runway busking JP-233 bombs. These bombs are being specially designed to deliver many small munitions. Some concrete penetrating bombs would crater the runways, and then mines would hamper repair operations. But this type of attack required the aircraft to fly directly over the target. Despite the intense darkness, the heavy flak and various attacks from the surface-to-air missiles, most of the tornado raids were successful. However, the scale of the anti-aircraft defenses was such that three tornadoes were shot down on three successive nights. Day four of the campaign brought a switch in tactics. Tornadoes went to medium-level attacks, flying at around 10,000 feet and using freethaw bombs against the airfields and other targets. Planning a largely unsung combat support role, the RAF Tinker Force was essential to the British war effort. The tankers ensured that each combat aircraft went into action with a few full load and, crucially, at precisely the time specified by their operational orders. Each heavily armed tornado needed two refuelings on the way to its target, and one on its way back. That meant that the tankers had to fly near or even in Iraqi airspace to wait for the returning tornadoes. But having seen a number of aircraft go out and perhaps one less return, the tanker crews felt the loss of the tornadoes just as keenly as the bomber crews themselves. One of the true success stories of the Gulf War was the use of precision-guided munitions, the so-called smart bombs. Back at home, viewers watching the air war on television were stunned by the accuracy with which these weapons could hit a target. Apparently, without any damage to the surrounding area, 
Some of the most enduring images of the war were those of laser-guided bombs going down ventilation shafts. RAF tornadoes began to drop laser-guided bombs, LGBT for short. On the 2nd of February 1991, some two weeks into the campaign, LGBs detect a splash of laser light reflected off the target. That light coming originally from an airborne laser designator. Initially, the veteran buccaneer provided this service for the tornadoes. The tornado buccaneer duo became deadly, hitting bridges and hardened air shelters and even Iraqi runways with unerring accuracy. Eight days later, the tornado force became operational with its airborne laser designator, the GEC Marconi Tiled Pod Thermal Imaging Airborne Laser Designator. Once air superiority had been established, the plan called for air attacks on tactical targets to soften up the battlefield. Prior to the land campaign, RAF Jaguars attacked the Iraqi army in Kuwait. As fighter bombers in the Second World War had harried German forces, so the Jaguars blew up ammunition dumps and fuel stores, missile sites, and tanks. At 0400 hours, on the 24th of February, the coalition ground troops moved in. The land campaign was swift. Around 100 hours, the Iraqi army surrendered. Kuwait had been liberated. Even years after the end of the war, controversy still raged on about the direct low-level attacks on airfields. The RAF lost six tornadoes, three of them in these attacks. Busting bombs have proved effective, but it still seemed a high price to pay for success. The need for increased flexibility was one of the key lessons of the Gulf War for the RAF, and it would not be long before the lessons were put to good use. In 1993, the United Nations ordered the policing over the skies of Bosnia-Herzegovina, an independent state recreated out of the breakup of Yugoslavia, which had descended into a civil war. As a part of Operation Deny Flight, Tornado F-3s were sent over to fly by Bosnia from their base in southern Italy, thus denying the Serbian aggressors the ability to launch their aircraft against Bosnian targets. But this time, there was no clear political directive about prosecuting a war. Ceasefires came and went, and frantic political efforts to end the conflict peacefully. It was all to no avail. By the summer of 1995, it was time for the UN to take direct action against the Serbs with Operation Deliberate Force. Serb gunnery positions and ammunition deposits and communications installations were the target of precision bombing. Once again, the laser-guided bombs showed their value in taking out key targets. Later on, the RAF and the Luftwaffe received new versions of the Tornado. GR-1BA maritime attack aircraft uses the German MBB Cormoran and the British Aerospace Sea Eagle anti-ship missiles. They're launched at standoff range and they then home onto the target with their built-in radar seekers. Finally, the new GR-4 bomber version with its so-called mid-life update to the original GR-1. It will have GPS navigation, improved weapon systems including Paveway 3. That's the newest generation with the US laser-guided bombs. There's also a new head-up display and a new undernose forward-looking infrared system. The GR-4 will also be completely target-capable, so it won't need another aircraft to provide laser designation. The penalty for all of this is that it loses its terrain-following radar. More than 900 tornadoes have been built. They continued to provide NATO, the Royal Air Force, the Luftwaffe, and the Italian Air Force with top-quality frontline aircraft. The then-recent changes would ensure that the Tornado stayed active in service as a proven combat aircraft in all of its many other varied roles. On the 17th of August 1966, the only prototype to have flown of Britain's most advanced aircraft project was towed down this road. It flew just 24 times, and the 200 million pounds that had been spent on its research and development was eventually to be reduced to just 50,000 pounds worth of scrap.
This is an aircraft graveyard at Shubriness in Essex, where once proud aeroplanes are used as targets to test the effects of gunfire and shrapnel. Such was the fate of TSR-2. What remains today of the TSR-2 project can only be found in museums, standing as testimony to the decisions that sealed its fate. Conceived in the 1950s, designed and flown in the early 60s, the story of TSR-2 is one of technological triumph and human endeavor. It was an aircraft years ahead of its time. The years 1950 to 1957 could be described as the post-war golden age of the British aircraft industry. Shop floors were full of priority orders, resulting from the Korean War panic. Design offices were working flat out on a whole series of advanced operational requirements for the RAF and the Navy. The Farnborough air shows revealed a procession of advanced prototypes and piloted scale models of shapes to come. Then, in 1957, the Secretary of State for Defense, Duncan Sands, presented his defense white paper to Parliament, which called for the elimination of manned aircraft in favor of missile systems. This left Britain's aircraft industry and the Royal Air Force with just one key project to pursue, the replacement of the highly successful and widely exported Canberra bomber. On the sort of aircraft we were looking at, we'd already looked at the idea of a specialized low-level bomber and that was cancelled in early 56 I think for quite good reasons as it was such a narrow role for an aircraft and we felt we still should go for low-level because we saw it as the only means of penetrating Soviet air defences, but equally we wanted it to be able to put on a reasonable performance altitude, and I'm talking anyway between 40 and 60,000 feet. Um, I say that because we visualise air um, operated engines, ordinary t uh, turbojets in other words, we weren't thinking of things like ramjets or anything. And we, we called it a uh, uh, tactical strike reconnaissance aircraft, hoping that that would convey the uh, uh, idea of our operational technique. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy had not been idle in identifying its requirement for a low-flying strike aircraft. In 1955, Blackburn Aircraft won the contract to develop the NA-39 Buccaneer, a twin-seat carrier-borne strike aircraft capable of flying under the enemy's surface vessel radar screen. The Navy had a powerful ally in Lord Louis Mountbatten, who, as Chief of the Defence Staff and a lifelong naval officer, tried to persuade the RAF to opt for a modified version of the Buccaneer as the Canberra replacement. Whilst this would have helped to reduce the costs for the Navy and ultimately the Air Force, the RAF felt that the Buccaneer would not fulfill their requirements. Now, the, the Buccaneer was an extraordinarily successful airplane. Um, it was built for mainly for low level work. Um, and, but the point was that the IF didn't think it was, at that stage, was fast enough or good enough high up. 
there's nothing wrong with the back of it. And contrary to the popular belief, and you may be very interested to hear this, that uh, in 1956, I asked Barry Late, who was then the chief designer of Blackburn's, um, if he would very kindly produce a brochure for me on the NA-39 for the Royal Air Force. And he did that. And we did consider it. It was very seriously considered. Uh, Matt Batten used to rather lie about that and say we never took any interest. But it was very seriously considered by the Air Force. Now, I think the real tragedy is that uh, the Tories should have had the sense to develop the Buccaneer into a strike reconnaissance aircraft for the Air Force, but the Air Force wouldn't agree to that. And Varel Begg later told me that he thought that the decision to go for the TSR-2 was in a sense compensation to the Air Force for the government's decision to give the nuclear deterrent to the Navy. And Varel Begg was head of the Navy. By March 1957, the RAF began to circulate its basic requirement under the title General Operational Requirement 339. The industry were to report back with designs and comments by January 1958. But in September 1957, the government dropped another bombshell on the industry. At Chelmex House, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Supply called a meeting of the heads of all the major aircraft companies and told them that following the 57 Defence White Paper, there was no certainty of further aircraft projects except GOR 339. He also told them that proposals would only be accepted from those firms who were prepared to collaborate together on the project. The government had effectively aimed a pistol at the industry's head. The message was amalgamate or die. The companies spent hundreds of thousands of man-hours developing their concepts. Amongst them, Vickers Armstrong, who came up with a single and twin-engine version of their Type 571, which was to be based on the new concept of a fully integrated airframe, engine, equipment and weapon system. English Electric was the only British company to have built an operational supersonic aircraft in the Lightning. They proposed their P-17 provided with a VTOL capability by the P-17D from Shorts, who'd been gaining valuable experience in vertical takeoff with their SC-1. The P-17 con concept was a very, very good one. And if you look at the... Um, uh, the general arrangement drawings of it, um, superimposed on a picture of the TSR-2, you'll find that uh, outwardly there's very little difference. The P-17 was to ride piggyback on the P-17D to give it a full vertical takeoff capability. The P-17D, which was powered by no fewer than 70 engines, was to enable the P-17 to take off and land back on the platform in the air. English Electric had got the measure of the supersonic bomber aspect absolutely right, but the, their solution to providing the short field takeoff and landing capability with this lifting platform, um, I think would have been immensely difficult to do, very costly, and I had some doubts as to its practicability. I, I, I didn't think it would work. The P-17D was dropped after the RAF redefined their requirement as OR-343, based solely on the Vickers English Electric submissions. Initially, the enforced amalgamation of the two companies was not welcomed. Well, frankly, we thought it was absolutely wrong. We thought it was um, um, a, a, a misjudgment uh, which would lead to cost overrun, delays, um, unnecessarily... Uh, complications in working out the uh, this very des complex design, um, which could much easier, easily have been done, much more easily have been done by one firm as a main contractor, um, 
uh, and if, if it did, if that one firm didn't have the the total manufacturing capacity to cope with the whole program, then they should have subcontracted it out to the other parts of the industry that could take it, take it on. English Electric had already ten years' experience in building supersonic um, military aircraft. No other firm in this country had. They had the Canberra behind them, and they had a, a design known as the P-17, uh, which was very close indeed to the um, specification which was put down subsequently for TSR-2. Nevertheless, the prime contract was given to, to Vickers. It's true to say that they, their experience lay in subsonic aircraft and in civil aircraft. The only military uh, plane I think that they built was the Valiant Bomb, which had um, uh, manifest structural uh, faults in design and was in fact withdrawn after five years, so you could say it was a failure. And yet, in spite of the contrast between the two firms' uh, experience and capability, uh, they were told to amalgamate, and the prime contract was given to because I think it was mistaken. Uh, English Electric uh, were regarded by the rest of the industry um, uh, as newcomers. Um, the great names, Hawkers, De Havilland's, Vickers, Bristol's, had been companies existing to way back uh, to World War I and even earlier. Uh, English Electric, the name English Electric only came into um, the, the, the general public view after World War II. Um, they had built um, very successfully a range of Hamden and Halifax bombers under license from Handy Page during the war. And then on the basis of that, a new design team was formed in 1945 um, specifically to design and build for the RAF its first jet bomber, the Canberra. Um, they, we were, uh, English Electric were regarded as newcomers by the rest of industry and I think slightly resented for that. By any standards at that time, TSR-2 was to be the most advanced aircraft in the world. It was to be capable of around Mark 1.1 at 200 feet and Mark 2 at medium and high altitudes with a radius of action of 1,000 nautical miles. The aircraft would need a completely new, fully automatic radar system, more advanced than anything else in existence, including terrain following and sideways looking radar with automatic updating of data. It was to be capable of taking a full reconnaissance fit, operate from short strips in all weather, and provide everything from long range nuclear strike to battlefield support. No self defense weapons were initially proposed, although there was a provision to carry four air-to-surface rockets. The government's choice of the Bristol Sidley Olympus engine was a controversial decision and was to lead to delays and massive cost overruns. We were strongly in favor of a Rolls-Royce engine, um, not least because we, did con uh, we considered that the Bristol Olympus development wasn't far ahead uh, and that we would end up with a, uh, in the classic situation which should be avoided in aircraft development. That's a new, a new design of aeroplane with a new design of engine right from flight one. That complicates the issues. Wherever you can, you should combine a new aeroplane with a, um, a well-proven engine. Rolls Royce at that day, they didn't want uh, all these aircraft succeed with Bristol engines. And this was before Rolls Royce bought up Bristol. The TSR-2 was going to have the Bristol Olympus. The 1154 was going to have a form of the um, Bristol Pegasus. And this really didn't suit Rolls Royce at all at the time. Uh, undoubtedly, the uh, development costs of the Olympus were a big factor in the escalating costs of the program. But much worse than that, in my view, was, was the unreliability of the engine. We, we did actually, as a, uh, to use the phrase I have just used, arrive at a classic situation where we had a brand new untried airplane with an engine which was not only unproved, it hadn't passed its um, uh, airworthiness type tests, but it actually had a known catastrophic failure on it which put, put the TSR-2 prototype at risk when we started flying. Problems with the engine would prove difficult to resolve 
and were not identified until after the first flight. The Vulcan Olympus flying testbed would later blow up whilst taxiing. The government placed the contract for nine pre-production aircraft with the Vickers English Electric Consortium in October 1960, more than 18 months after the contract had first been announced. In spite of mounting opposition from the Navy and the Treasury, Britain's most ambitious aircraft project yet devised had been given the go-ahead. Vickers, under Sir George Edwards, was to be the prime contractor and responsible for the front fuselage section, which included the cockpit, weapon systems and budget control. English Electric, led by its chief designer, Freddie Page, was to concentrate on the aerodynamics, wings, tail and rear fuselage. From an early stage, the consortium responded to the project's critics in Whitehall by illustrating their design philosophy, as seen in this film extract, presented by their chief project engineer, Ollie Heath. With a tailplane so designed as to release the whole of the wing, four flap blowing, the provision of adequate thrust to weight ratio secured by powerful Olympus 22R engines giving a thrust to weight ratio of 0.6. The requirement for rudimentary operation, rudimentary field operation by large wheels, which despite the requirements for low cross-sectional area, are stowed within the aeroplane without drag penalty. The crosswind requirements met by the large parachute, which of course also confers the short landing facility. The, rain. the advanced technology of the aircraft was mirrored in the complexity of the manufacturing, which was to employ new working practices and advanced materials. Other problems relating to project management control would lead to delays. One of the um, most delaying aspects of the program was that many of the subcontractors um, were uh, working directly with the ministry uh, and not, not under the control of, of, of the central uh, con uh, management organization, that is BAC. And this, this led to complications, misunderstandings, and inevitable delays. I remember one famous occasion when I, one of the committees that I attended of industry and the ministry officials and, and civil servants from the establishments uh, and elsewhere, um, the, the chairman took a look round the room when we started in St. Giles Court, long room, full of cigarette smoke and, and, and battered cups of tea. And um, he took a look round the room, he said, I want a count taken. And there was a head count taken at this meeting and uh, there were 58 people in the room. And the chairman quite reasonably said, this is quite ridiculous, no, nobody could control a programme with meetings this size. I want you all to go away and we're, we're, the next meeting is convened for such and such a date and I want to see a significant reduction in the numbers at that meeting. And in due course we all came back to the reconvened meeting and there were 61 in the room. Uh, the Ministry, for instance, annexed control of the cockpit layout. I think arbitrarily at, at some point. Um, and there was a civil servant in the ministry who was in charge, and I quote, as far as the government was concerned. Uh, but um, there are a lot more to it than that. Uh, I think that the contractor had a seat um, on his committee, but um, that didn't represent control either. Uh, in my own experience, we had cockpit committee meetings which spent days not only just trying to decide where one particular switch should go but what the caption should be under the switch and then they des they decided against the advice of the operators in, the, in that case me um, to put a caption under a vital switch which made no sense to the air crew at all and eventually before we flew it had to be changed and this is a typical example of the 
uh, very simple, silly delays that occurred in the program. In the United States, the advanced technology and potential of TSR2 had been a source of concern, and progress of the project had been closely monitored. They sent a, a, um, a team over from the Pentagon in 1960 under um, uh, an official called Cortland Perkins, and uh, they expressed, they went all over the uh, TSR2 building, they expressed enormous enthusiasm. They let uh, <coughs> the British Aircraft Corporation, they let them, to un uh, let, let them understand that they would be interested in purchasing. They were nothing of the kind. They were interested in finding out what was going on, uh, in order to adapt it <coughs> into their own version, which came much later and much less successfully, the F-111. Now, I don't blame the Americans. Well, I think it's, been, it's become very clear since those days uh, that um, the Americans were primarily very worried about the emergence of TSR-2 because they saw it as a direct challenge uh, to the military air supremacy that they were aiming to establish with their F-111 swing wing low-level attack aeroplane, which was designed for a very similar role to TSR-2. Early in 1960, American industry was asked what the time seemed impossible. It was asked to design an airplane that would fly faster at any altitude than any existing fighter. It was behind it in time. It ran into enormous technical problems, and it overrun, uh, overran its cost. Uh, predictions very, very greatly. But we know that the Americans thought that the TSR-2 was a threat, that if we had been as successful with TSR-2 as we had been with its predecessor, the Canberra, which was so good, if you remember, that the Americans themselves bought the, uh, the Canberra, I think they saw the TSR as a threat to their potential worldwide interest in exporting military airplanes, and they were very anxious to get rid of it. The Australians, who had also purchased the Canberra bomber, found themselves in a similar position to the RAF in looking for a suitable replacement. I think the Australians needed to replace their Canberras, and therefore, uh, as they usually they looked a bit and said, what are you doing? You must be replacing yours. I made two visits to Canberra with uh, teams from British Aerospace to make presentations on the TSR2 program, uh, during which we understand that they were um, uh, planning to acquire 30, 30 airframes. Royal Air Force was planning to have 150, and this 30 would have made a nice addition to, uh, and made the production run really stable. Um, during the early part of 1964, was the year in which the uh, aeroplane first flew, we understood that the Australian government had virtually signed up uh, for a contract for TSR-2. After more than five years' work, the first prototype, XR219, was transported in sections to the Aircraft and Armament Experimental Establishment at Boscombe Down in Wiltshire, where it would take three months to assemble. The choice of Boscombe Down as the site of the flight test program was a compromise solution. English Electric's base at Wharton in Lancashire would have been an ideal support and maintenance base. Vickers had wanted the first flight to take place from their airfield at Wisley. Roland Beaumont argued that the Wisley runway was too short. Working from Boscombe down would create more problems. Nobody really wanted us there, or they did their very best to help us, I must say. We didn't want to be there. We had the worst of both communication worlds. We were 150 miles from Morton and 60 miles from Weybridge. Uh, where we ought to have been doing all that work on one base with all the experts just around the block. The sum total of delays and resultant cost increases that were plaguing the project meant the planned in-service date had to be put back. 
This news poured further fuel on the fire of mounting opposition from the project's critics. Mountbatten, perhaps TSR2's most determined critic, was still pushing hard for the Buccaneer. He visited Australia and met their defence minister, Sir Frederick Scherger. He said that it would, uh, he went round the place saying that it was absolutely what the Air Force wanted and everybody knew this and he used to uh, go around with a briefcase with model, with, with, uh, with, with one model of the TSR2 and five of the Buccaneers and put them on the table in front of people like Scherger in Australia and say you can have five of these for one of those, so why do you bother? Mount Batten, to the best of my knowledge, told them they wouldn't be coming into service. Um, or certainly poured cold water on it. The Australians listened to this, and by the time we started flying in August, uh, we had been given to understand that the, the Australians were almost certainly shifting and going for the F-111. I'm sure they would have bought the TSR too, um, but they had it gone ahead. The newly assembled and freshly painted TSR-2 was wheeled out in September 1964 to commence its engine runs and taxi trials. Roland Beaumont and other members of his flight test team still had nagging concerns about the unresolved engine and undercarriage problems. The continuing build-up of political pressure and adverse media criticism was heightened by the looming general election, with the ruling Conservative government looking set to lose. Meanwhile, a meeting was convened at Boscombe Down. In view of the October election and the Labour Party's uncertain support for the project, the question on everybody's lips was, when could TSR2 make its first flight? A successful flight before the election might prove critical to the project's survival. The chief project test pilot was faced with a very difficult decision. He was well aware of the dangers of an engine failure and of the consequences of cancellation. Don Bowen, my um, observer, uh, backseater, um, and I um, were the people on whom the total responsibility of this enormous pyramidal organization were going to fall on flight one. Uh, but it wasn't a, a sudden precipice to go over. We'd been doing taxi trials on the airplane, testing all its systems out on the ground. We'd taxied it up to take off speed, tested the parachute, the brakes and all the rest of it. Um, by the time we were ready to fly on that day, uh, I had uh, any doubts about the, the, the capability of the airplane uh, had long since gone. I, I was very confident that it was going to fly well. Uh, an extraordinarily good moment when you turn onto the runway, you call for clearance to go, you get clearance from the tower, five, four, three, two, one, breaks off. You light the reheat and go, and from then on, you know exactly what it's supposed to do, and your task is just to be totally alert to see if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, it's a fascinating moment, it's a professionally enormously satisfying. And then when you come airborne and you find this new device actually performs as well as predicted, or even in the case of TSR2, better, 
rescheduled to fly the TSR-2 first flight for 30 minutes. We, in fact, flew for 27 minutes. Halfway through that, at the end of the first circuit round Boscombe, I had formed the opinion that this was far more than a questionable aeroplane. This was a brilliant first attempt at getting this complex aeroplane right. It was so good and so right on flight one after 10 minutes that I was enjoying the sensation of just relaxing and feeling this is a marvellous aeroplane. I felt I'd been there before. The first flight had demonstrated the potential of the aircraft, but for technical reasons it was not to fly again until the very last day of the year. In the meantime, there had been a change of government. On the 16th of October, the results of the polls confirmed the predicted Labour win. Out went the Tories and with them went government backing for TSR2. The fate of TSR2 was now in the hands of the new Labour administration. I'm certain they were evasive. And I looked at the Labour Party manifesto to see whether it said anything about it just the other day. And it's pretty uninformative. Uh, attack the government, of course, for the uh, way in which the aviation industry had been handled in the previous 10, 13 years. That's standard stuff. But it didn't contain any real commitment to the TSR2 in particular. And uh, I think in Preston there was some promise put about in the campaign that TSR2 would be safe under Labour, but. Uh, I don't think there was any other indication that they were committed to it, and they, and they were, as I say, I think pretty evasive. Yes, well, we ran into a number of unexpected problems at Boston Down. Uh, first of all, it was planned that I should fly it uh, for the first uh, four or five flights until I was satisfied with its handling qualities because uh, you, you have continuity of experience. The more you fly a new type of airplane, obviously the safer the flying becomes because you're on a learning curve. On flight two, um, we had a very severe um, vibration problem. Uh, we had it again on flight three. These were engine-associated problems, or engine-system-associated problems. Um, and then on flight five, we had a major out an undergauge malfunction, which could have lost us the prototype. It was actually um, an abandoned aircraft case had we chosen to take that road. But in consultation with uh, uh, Don Bowen in the back, I said, OK, Don, this is, here's your opportunity to uh, try out Martin Baker, that was the ejection seat. And he said, what are you going to do, B? And I said, I think I'm going to try and land it. And there was a long pause from the back, and he said, you're not going to get rid of me that easily, I'm staying. And so we, but we landed it with the undercarriage of the wrong place. Um, there, were, there were a number of problems with the undercarriage. The first one we encountered was sequencing. The undercarriage was not carrying out the correct sequencing um, in, lower, in raising and lowering, and that took some time to get right. The next one was that it was a long, what's known as a long stroke undercarriage to absorb this great shock. This, in fact, um, resulted in it being quite flexible fore and aft. And from the first landing onwards, we found when we touched down with this aeroplane, the undercarriage literally twanged 
um, it swung back as we as we touched the ground. Um, uh, it caused vibrations to run right through the airframe and to reach the crew the crew area, the cockpit in the nose of the airplane, as a very powerful lateral lateral oscillation. Um, you had a, an oscillation which was about the same rate as the natural frequency of the human eyeball. Um, so that at the moment you touched out, you stopped being able to see the runway for, for a fraction of a second. The very nature of test flying will invariably throw up the occasional dramatic moment. Um, that was a one-off. It was a pilot on his first flight on the airplane. He hadn't quite understood the dynamics of the airplane. Um, and he'd got his approach slightly wrong. And he, he touched down at a, at a very high rate of descent. When we got um, to flight 20, I think it was, up at Wharton, uh, we, we were clear of all the minor snags on the airplane, and we thought, now's the time to get on to curing this, under, or investigating this undercarriage problem. The first thing to do was to measure the difference between touching down on a dry runway and touching down on a very reduced coefficient of friction runway, low mu. Uh, that was obtained by getting the fire brigade to spread foam on the runway, and Jimmy Dunnell touched down on the foam with the on onboard vibration sensors measuring the vibration set up at that point, and they were then directly compared with the similar vibrations caused on touching down on a dry runway. That was all part of the research to get that one right. It became apparent that the next and vital stage uh, of the flight development of the airplane um, was going to need, need expertise, knowledge and facilities which didn't exist at the Weybridge end of the consortium. They existed in large measure at Wharton uh, uh, and this type of airplane was right within Wharton's expertise so it gradually became apparent in the management of the program that uh, thinking changed towards moving the first prototype and the subsequent flight development, which was going to be at least three years and 3,500 hours of testing, in toto up to Wharton uh, under the charge of Freddie Page, who was the chief designer. Flight 14 was not simply a return home. Roland Beaumont, having satisfied himself that the aircraft was performing as planned, took TSR-2 supersonic for the first and only time. Engaging reheat on just one engine, the acceleration was such that he left Jimmy Dell behind, even though he had engaged full reheat on both Avon engines of his Lightning. Um, this new aeroplane was, despite its difficulties, despite its management problems, uh, despite the rather unpleasant and hazardous faults that had occurred in some of the first few flights, it was now showing itself to be a tremendous thoroughbred. It was going to be a wonderful aeroplane. It was always already extraordinarily satisfying to fly as a professional. Um, and. Uh, I had been looking forward enormously to you know, shaking the dust of Boston uh, off my feet figuratively and flying this aeroplane back to my own base where even the voice of the air traffic controllers were my friend. And we, we flew back into that environment, we brought it home and now we were going to get on with it and uh, no holds barred. A very good feeling. Seventeen aircraft that formed the development batch were in varying states of readiness at the factories. The second prototype, XR220, was at Boscombe Down and programmed for its first flight on the 6th of April 1965. But the gathering momentum of opinion against the project had become unstoppable. 
I can't be sure when the decision was taken in Cabinet, but the decision was taken in the relevant Cabinet committee on the same occasion as we decided to cancel the P-1154 and the transport aircraft. But Wilson was very frightened because there was much more public interest in the TSR-2 than the other aircraft <coughs> to put it in the same package. So he asked us to delay it until the budget in April. And that's when the formal decision was taken and announced. He called the contractors at midday to the ministry uh, on the day in which cancellation was to be announced in the budget debate, and he told them that it was going to be cancelled. So immediately they did what any reasonable person would. They requested permission to ring up their workforce, to ring up their factories, and to warn everybody themselves rather than allow them to learn about this frightful blow in their lives over the radio or the newspaper. And Roy Jenkins refused. He said it was a budget secret. Quite extraordinary. And we never got a satisfactory explanation of why it was done that way. And uh, I, I still don't understand why it was done that way, because it was, it was, it was an insult to the House <laughs> to make an announcement in that particular form where there was no possibility of questioning at all. Oh, it was just a feeling of inevitability. We'd been struggling. We'd put every possible effort, uh, and when I say we, I mean the whole workforce, the all the engineers, the ground staff, uh, the air crew, of course, the flight developers, the airworthiness people, administrators backing it all up, had been working on a, an all-hours basis. Uh, there was no knock-off time. You worked on through the night. Uh, leave was cancelled. Family arrangements were disrupted. Tensions developed in families because husbands were overworked, overstressed. This had been going on for years. Well, I think there was a tremendous feeling of letdown initially. You know, it, it was a, a terrible disappointment to a lot of people who were thoroughly committed to the project, which was just beginning to fly and, and you know, taking, literally taking off. Everybody who was concerned with the efficiency of the Air Force thought that the TSR-2 would be too late in service to meet the Air Force's needs. That was the first thing. Secondly, its cost had tripled in the four years before I got in. Uh, its time of delivery had extended by three years, and there was no guarantee they'd have kept to the cost and timing as I was given it. Well, I think the nail in the coffin, the sort of trigger reason, was when the Australians refused to buy it and opted for the American plane at the beginning of 1964. In order not to waste all the knowledge and the potential uh, knowledge to be gained from these things, and also, of course, with an eye on trying to keep people in employment, not only in our factories, but in the component factories and suppliers, we put forward a program um, to, to the Ministry within two weeks of cancellation, proposing that the two pro prototypes should be kept on, I think, a 100-hour uh, test and development program um, uh, for research into the future Concorde test program, because they're very similar types of aeroplane. Um, much valuable information would be gained, and I think we put it forward on the basis of a fixed price contract. We were asking for one and a half million pounds to do 100 hours of, of detailed, concentrated research. Uh, Roy Jenkins said uh, that means it must cost at least two million and in my experience you've got to double that and that means four million and that's too much. So uh, there was a complete, uh, a complete shock. Following the cancellation came one of the most bizarre episodes in the history of British aviation. For some, it appeared that the cancellation of TSR2 was not enough. Orders were given to destroy everything.
completely uh, massive publicity was given, obviously with official blessing, uh, to operatives in our factories who had actually built these airframes, dragging them out onto the tarmac, uh, shoving oily rags in them and setting fire to them, particularly to the magnesium areas which burnt like a follicle. I think it's the most shameful aspect of this sad story. There is no sort of reason whatsoever except uh, what you could really describe as a selfish determination to ensure that that aeroplane would never be built under any other circumstances or in the future. I never heard anybody connected with this project uh, who um, was other than shocked by this decision. I can't tell you who took it, but uh, it, it, uh, the finger must point at the government in some, in, in, in one department or other. Well, it wasn't ordered by me, I can tell you that. Absolutely not. And I don't think it was ordered by Roy Jenkins, who was the only other minister who would have had a say. Uh, I know then that I just had the immense, um, uh, dramatic task uh, of um, inviting some hundreds of my staff to consider the fact that they were going to be made redundant. And all these dedicated people of high skills were just shown their, uh, shown their cards, and many of them went to America, of course. In America, in 1964, the F-111 was taking shape. Following meetings with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, Dennis Healy had become convinced that the F-111 would fulfill the RAF's requirements, whilst being cheaper and in service earlier than TSR-2. Events would prove him wrong, as this project also ran into problems of delay and spiralling costs, a fact that the Australians would later come to pay dearly for. Whilst Dennis Healy was talking to McNamara, Prime Minister Wilson was meeting President Johnson to discuss a number of areas of mutual interest. Wilson wanted U.S. backing for the pending loan from the IMF. The thinking back in Britain was that the Americans had extracted a heavy price for their support by demanding the cancellation of TSR2. I don't think international diplomacy operates quite so crudely as that. Um, we wanted good relations with the Americans. But there was never any suggestion in my mind that um, uh, a condition for having um, IMF support. The Americans wanted a variety of things. They, they, wanted, um, they wanted to sustain sterling as a sort of auxiliary currency to the dollar. The IMF had already decided a week earlier to give us the loan we needed and we got the necessary loan from other governments as well. So that didn't enter into the discussions in any way. They wanted us to maintain East of Suez role, as it were, to share a world role with us. And they were quite keen to, um, um, not specifically that we should cancel the TSR-2, but they would like us to buy the F-111, for exactly the same reason that we would like the Australians to, to, to buy the TSR-2. Britain did order the F-111, but ironically, the deal would later fall victim to exactly the same problems that plagued TSR-2. In the interim, the RAF found themselves having to deal with the gap that TSR-2's cancellation had caused. What we had to do when it was removed from the program was to start um, innovating, improvising, um, and, and making good the shortfall, and that's something which the Royal Air Force historically has always been extremely good at. And of course what we did was to um, uh, re-plan uh, and reprogram and retrain the V-Force uh, so that it could go low level for part of its attacks. That was one of the moves that we, we, that we uh, 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 put on the board in order to make good the deficiency of the TSR-2. Well, I think TSR2 um, is probably an example, and it, 
uh, it's uh, wrong to lay down the law on the matter when you, you you know when you don't know all the facts and haven't got access to all the books and records. But I think it is an example, and we've seen far too many of them um, before and since, and even to this day, of British governments um, uh, not seeming to value the uh, importance of a thriving aerospace industry. I think what was the case um, was that, um, um, that I and maybe and some other people too, um, Chancellor Jim Callaghan, George Byrne, who was first Secretary of State, thought, and I think thought with some justification, that the aircraft industry was consuming too large um, a proportion of our research and development resources, and also that it was, it was too keen, for understandable reasons, not unworthy reasons, it was too keen on uh, sort of um, breaching the frontiers of knowledge on aircraft design, rather than concentrating on making and selling planes which it could make and sell. Well, nobody, in, 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 it's 30 years now, and nobody has ever in that time given me a clear and reasonable explanation of why it was cancelled. I called my book The Murder of TSR2, and that I believe is exactly what happened. Um, though to put your finger precisely on the murderer is less easy, there were a good many. It was um, August the 17th, 1966 when the uh, fuselage arrived. Previously to that, two or three days before that, we'd had a couple of TSR wings uh, arrived here at Shubin S. White City. They all came in bit by bit and we've then proceeded to build it up until the state that it is on that picture behind me on our apron. It was quite a showpiece. It was a beautiful aircraft. It was way ahead of its time, so we was informed. And I personally think it was a criminal act to get rid of it as, she, as it was done. But it was our job in them days to disrupt, to test the vulnerability of fuselages, systems, uh, wings, anything like that. That is our job. Unfortunately, the TSR was one of them. And when she finally met her death here, there were several of us that was very, very sad. And we remember very well to this day. Uh, we have got one or two little bits and pieces of us still remaining, but nothing of any size or bulk. The only one that flew, she was destroyed, which I feel very sad about. In the end, TSR2 fell victim to the many factors that conspired against it. Politics, both national and international inter-service rivalry, and an unwieldy management structure, all ensured that delays and escalating costs became inevitable. If the cancellation of the project was the result of a callous political decision, then TSR2 was also a victim of its own ambition. I think it was um, a bridge too far I think it was a very ambitious, expensive, and at the same time extremely capable military aeroplane, which was perhaps too far advanced for our Air Force uh, and our Ministry of, of Procurement um, to cope with. The concept was probably too great for them. They hadn't grown up. They should have done. You know, it's all been done since. And, and we'd gone a long way to doing it then. But this was actually fundamentally lack of faith in the ability of our aircraft industry to produce those sort of goods. We were, in fact, leading the world at the time, but the actions of the politicians made sure we would never do it again. <laughs>